Welcome to Inclusive Cyber, your front row seat to understand how a diverse mix of voices is not just necessary, but essential to protect our most sensitive computer networks and personal data. I'm your host, Danny Magallanes, and through my podcast, we shine the spotlight on the heroes and trailblazers from every corner of society who are redefining the diversity, equity, and inclusion frontier. Every episode is a step towards a cyber community that's as varied as it is united, where everyone has the keys to unlock their potential and the power to protect our digital world. Join us on this journey where every listen, every share, every dialogue inches us closer to this new reality. In this episode, I'm excited to speak with Sherry Payne the president for Women in Cybersecurity of Colorado. We met last spring at a Metro State University cybersecurity event and have talked all things cybersecurity since then. She's been in cybersecurity for roughly 10 years, working for several telecommunication companies and currently working for SMB and is the go-to cybersecurity person for the company. We discussed the best entry-level position in cybersecurity, what it means to be a leader, mentorships, and much more. Please subscribe, like, and share via your favorite social media platforms. Hope you enjoy the episode. Sherry, good afternoon. How's it going today? Good. How are you, Danny? Thank you for having me. Uh, I am good as well. I know we've been trying to get you on the show here for the past couple of months, but uh, I want to thank you for joining me in this discussion here in Inclusive Cyber. We met earlier this year at uh, MSU event. Is that right? Yes. It seems forever ago. It does. Yes. Time is so warped uh, nowadays, so you can't really tell. But can you just give a quick background for everybody? What, uh, where you're at, and what are some of the organizations that you're a part of? Yes. So I have been in security for almost ten years. I started at a couple of large telecommunication companies, and I moved into another communication platform. So I'm still in that um, space, and I am the president for WESIS of Colorado. And for those of you who don't know what WESIS stands for, it stands for Women in Cybersecurity, and they're a global organization that provides educational uh, mentoring a lot of opportunity for students and people who are either new to the industry as as they're graduating from college or they're trying to transition into security. So they really help folks in that targeted demographic to get into the working market. And then Colorado, and just like any other local chapters, we put on other events locally, uh, both virtually and in person to try to provide that at, at a local level. So um, I am currently now in uh, the privacy and data protection space. And because I work for a smaller company, um, I'm the person that does it all. So I might have a fancy title, but a lot of times at the end of the day, I have to do a lot of things and wear different hats. So it's, uh, it makes my life a little bit more interesting. I appreciate that background. You mentioned that you've been in the industry for about 10 years. Can you walk us back on where you were at that time and what made you interested in IT and cybersecurity? This is one of the questions I ask people all the time, why you want to get in security. And some of the questions I get, you can tell that if I had a chance to reflect on it or not. And so I really had the opportunity. Some At the time, I didn't see it was an opportunity, but now I see it as an opportunity to really for me to reflect, okay, I'm at a juncture in my life where I am able to take the time to figure out what I want to do next. And so I have always been interested in technology, and but that's really broad, right? So I dug a little bit more and I talked to more people and it came down to one of my core values is I, I have a really strong sense of justice. So what role or what industry can I go to that will always allow me to do the right thing. And I got lucky enough and I landed in cybersecurity and I decided going back to school and getting a master's was the right thing to do. So that's what I did. I decided to go back to school 
and got really lucky and fortunate, got introduced to some people and was able to find the first gig at a telecommunication company before I graduated. So that's where I started my journey. One of the things I really think is important for you to ask is figure out why you want to get into it and not just, oh, it's a hot thing. It's, it sounds interesting and whatever all the external benefits that people used to get into security for. I also tell them the ugly things. Ugly being the reason why you get paid a little bit more is because it's really stressful. You have a lot on your plate and sometimes no news is good news in the security world, but no news isn't always good news when it comes to the executives who's fishing out a lot of money, right? For the security department, if, you ha if you're lucky enough to have a department. I hope that answers your question. No, it does. And I appreciate what you said about justice and kind of your why on why you want to get into any industry, not only cybersecurity. A lot of people come up, and, and I'm sure you probably get more of it being in, the, in WESA's, on what do I need to do to get into the industry? And I get those questions and I kind of struggle on how to answer it because I don't want to give my, be negative. I always want to be positive, especially with people that I meet and they're energized to get into our industry. Yeah. How do you handle those type of questions? So we just kind of touch upon it. I really ask them the why they want to mm -hmm. get into the industry. The reason why I'm really big on that, not just because we all follow Simon Sinek, but really at the end of the day, when you hit those hard hurdles, when you're looking for a job, when you're getting a lot of rejections or not even getting interviews or call back, or people calling you back after one interview, I think if you have an idea of why you want to get into this industry if you have never been in it before you're transitioning or this is where you're trying to break into i think that's important number one do you understand why you're getting into it don't get into it just to take a job because if you take your first job and it turns out it's the wrong one or the people are really toxic or are bad fit for whatever reason you're honestly a lot of times worse off than you were had you not had a job just because it's adding a whole different kind of level of stress so that's usually one question I ask. Do you know the good and the bad and the ugly of why you want to get into security? Because mm -hmm. it seems like really shiny on the outside, but it's not. It has a really dark side to it when, especially a lot of people who are new, right? They get into it. They get into incident response. They're on call. I had to manage 24 by 17. It was, I may not have been the person right staring at the screen, but I had to almost be that. And I had to manage the people to make sure that they were there. If not, then the buck stops with me and I had to be on call. And I did that for a number of years. And so if you didn't have a really strong why and eventually understand what you're doing is important to you, but also to the company that you're there for, it would be really hard for you to sustain that kind of lifestyle. So those are the kind of two that I really make sure that they understand. And then after that, it's easy because then you can give them an idea. Okay. If you have a sense of why you have a sense of understanding really what you're getting to then you can help them focus what are you interested in okay these the coach you coach them a little bit say okay tell me exactly what you're interested in are you interested in research are you interested in um, boots on the ground meaning maybe incident response is the best thing for you because you like that it's really exciting when something happens when you find something how do they get in you find all the things and you're able to poke around and so sometimes people really like that thrill of the hunt and the chase and trying to basically figure out the bad guy. And another thing I asked them is, are you interested in management? Meaning, are you interested in people? Or eventually being people? Or do you want to be that keyboard person? Do you want to be the person clicking the button, building the tools? When, before I graduated with my degree, I sat down with myself and I thought, okay, do I want to be the engineer? Do I want to be the hands-on keyboard person? Or do I want to be a people manager? The person that's leading the people and making sure they're inspired and give them the support and the resources that they need to do their job. And so I think that's also really important to figure out where your strengths are. I knew I couldn't, I still, Everyone does, right? But I knew I couldn't be the person who's staring at the screen 24 seven with no interaction. That was going to be really hard for me. And so you have to really understand yourself in a way that makes sense to you. Don't lie to yourself. If you want to be the boss because you want to be the boss, that's a terrible reason to get into management. If you're not one of those people who take responsibility for things, I don't recommend you being the boss. 
just because you'll take on all the things that everybody has has going on in their lives, right? And you're, you're the therapist, you're the parent, you're the boss, you're the peer counselor because you're trying to figure out, trying to help them, all, all kind, with all kinds of stuff, right? So once I kind of figure out what they're interesting and what they think their strengths are, so if they come tell me and they're like, hey, I don't have enough technical skills, or if I can identify they don't have enough confidence. I actually had a conversation with、um, a gal the other day. It was very obvious that she was very Capable. She was very smart. She had a lot of background and experience and other things, right? That can be transferred to her new role or whatever role she was looking at. But she didn't have that confidence.、Um, and so then I can guide them, give them an idea. Okay, from a hiring perspective, if they're able to convey the candidate, be able to convey, hey, I may not have the experience because I've never done it before, but I know for a fact that I can because here's the skills and here's my track record. So getting them to be able to articulate that during an interview, I think, is really important. So build them up a little bit from confidence perspective because I find a lot of people, they come to you, they all almost want somebody to give them like that. That light, just to say, okay, yeah, give them a little bit of permission and be like, go for it. You know,、mm-hmm. if you're not going to do it, no one else is going to do it for you. But then you just give them a little push, and I find that usually gives them a little bit of that support that they were looking for. So that's my thought on that. So a, a lot of good nuggets of information there, Sherry, that I want to touch upon. But I, I want to backtrack a little bit. You had mentioned the SOC analyst and understanding your why. Would you think? I guess from a entry level position, based on your experience, would the SOC be a good place? I think it is, and I don't quite believe in the you gotta put in your dues. I don't agree with that.、Um, but the reason why I know a SOC role or analyst would be a good spot to start is.、Mm. It's easier to get because nobody wants the job. You normally <laughs> work really terrible hours if they haven't figured out how to automate it, or、um, they don't have teams throughout the world to be able to follow the sun. Which means your team, wherever you're based,、um, is you're responsible twenty four seven in this one area that you're in,、right. and that can be challenging. And so, not only from a scheduling perspective, I most likely you're going to get the happy role, which is the I think the worst one was. You come in, I believe, at four, and you leave at three, and then so it's like a ten-hour shift, and then you would come in with an hour lunch, and then you would come in. I think the latest was eight o'clock, and you would leave at seven, depending, right? If you think you're a night owl and you do that long term, the eight o'clock to seven a.m. Yeah, you do. You decide that you're not <laughs> a night owl because、right. it does mess with your circadian rhythm, and so and it impacts your family, and then you get three days off. So then you got to figure out, okay, do I? Go back to the rest of the world where I operate during the day. So I think that's really hard. But the reason why I say it's easier to get into because if you have a role where they're hard to fill, it's easier to get in. And then another thing is where I was at. It's easy for you to honestly take on a lot of different responsibilities. There were a lot of opportunities to learn different tools. There were a lot of just. Freedom to really for you to dive and dig and poke at a whole bunch of random things, right? It could be a lot of false positive, but it could be a real thing. You have ten hours. Most likely, something was not going to happen the day you walked in, and、right. um, you know, once in a while there'd be something going on. But you're a firefighter in the cyber cyberspace where you're working out and doing nothing until there's a fire. So that's what you train for. I think it's a good spot to start just because you get a lot of experience. If you start in there as a SOC、mm-hmm. analyst, you Get a variety of different things. You get a variety of different exposure to a lot of different business units because security typically don't own anything, right? We don't own a process, we don't own a tool, we don't own a system. We basically provide a service to help investigate from an incident response perspective. So you get a lot of exposure to different things, and then、um, you also get a chance to build relationships with different areas that you may not otherwise、um, have that opportunity if you're just focused on one thing. Appreciate you going in depth into that, and then backtracking a little bit in your previous response about trying to understand if you want to be hands on keyboard all the time, or if you want to shift to that that people manager. How? What do you recommend, or what traits do you see in people when they want to choose? Let's say the the manager position versus the hands on keyboard. What recommendations would you give to them, and especially the ones that 
you know, they're, they might be rough around the edges or maybe they're not effective communicators. What would you tell them? Ask yourself, do I want to be a manager? If your likeliness response is not really, that's probably a good start because right. <laughs> I find the people who actually are like, yes, I want to do it. They're probably in it for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. So ask yourself, do you want to do it? Do you cringe a little bit? You're probably the right person just because there's a, like I mentioned, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with it. Make sure that you are okay with that. So instead of being responsible for just you and what you're responsible for that 10 hour shift, right? Are you okay with responsible for an entire team and the successful of that team? And the one person or two people who aren't doing very well, are you okay with spending some time with them and coaching them and making sure that they have what they need? So my job I saw was always there to clear the hurdles that my team had and then provide them the resources that they need to do their job. I'm not there to tell them what to do because they're the experts. I'm not the one from the computer, right? I'm not the right. one that's going to be training them. I'm not the one that's going to be like, this alert means that and that. that. It's like, I understand it, but I'm not the one in it. Another thing is ask yourself if you're willing to, to grow. Are you willing to take time outside of work to really be able to do some self-reflection and learn more about yourself, be more self-aware mm -hmm. and be okay if you're wrong, be okay with it and confront that from your own perspective and be able to admit that sometimes if you're wrong, if you provide the wrong device or you said the wrong things in a meeting or you maybe have made the wrong comment or whatever that is, right? Um, you have to take a lot of that ownership on you. So if you're somebody who's always, well, this is my, my job, that's not my job, you're going to have to change your mindset and focus on that a little bit. But I find that People who are good leaders tend to do a lot of self-reflecting. They read a lot. They also are very self-aware and they develop on their communication skills all the time. You're never at the point where, oh, I'm a perfect communicator. I'm not going to say anything, right? Because Danny, when you talk to somebody who's rough around the edges, you have to communicate them in a way that they understand, right? If you're diplomatic and you're going to speak vaguely and imply things, they're not going to respect you. They're, they might be confused or they might have no idea what you're saying. And then mm. you have somebody who is maybe shy or you have another person that just won't stop talking. So you have to adapt to them in a way where you are conveying the same messages to each person. It's really easy to basically, I think, play favorites. Like you're, you're a parent, you're not supposed to have a favorite child. I want to say I'm like the, my mom's favorite child. So you always have a favorite child. And um, so you're like that, you can't play. So you have to find a way to communicate to the person, but deliver the same message and say, okay, this is how we succeed. This is our rule. These are uh, what we're trying to do. These are the goals. And this is the mission of the department, whatever the message you're trying to get, make sure you convey the same thing, but you have to do it in a different way. And that sometimes is challenging. And then you have to af obviously not be afraid of confrontation because if you have a person that's just not performing very well or dragging the team town or is just jerk in general, you have to be able to confront that person in a way that's effective and you don't take it personally. It's a lot, but I think people who are willing to do that and do those things, I think will find a lot of rewards. One of the things I find most rewarding is I will hear, not often, but often enough where I'll have people come to me years later and say, hey, you hired me for my first security role. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all the things that you've done. You were the best manager. Those are great things to hear. And for giving people that opportunity to really get into the cybersecurity arena and watching them flourish and shine. As you're going through and, and talking about what it means to be a leader, making me think about my former leaders. And just a quick story, I remember when I was in government, one of uh, a mentor, he was not my supervisor. He would always ask me, hey, when, you, when are you going to be a supervisor? And my response was always, I'm not ready. Because just like you said, it takes a whole different mentality to be a leader, right? It, it, and it has nothing to do with titles. So a leader, you could be an entry level position and be a leader, a, a leader, right? Mm -hmm. So when I told them, I'm like, look, I'm not ready because I don't want to give my teams or the people under me incorrect information or lead them astray because I don't know everything. And that that was my perspective. And I remember what he said. He he just points. Do you think any of these people are doing any of that you said? <laughs> and I said, no. He put it in, but I still did it. Because again, just like you said, it's a sense of responsibility that you need to provide them everything they need to be successful. And you want them 
to be higher than you. I'm seeing a lot in, in leadership now that it's almost trying to keep people down. I don't want this person in my team to be higher than me. And that's never been my, my perspective or philosophy is I want you to all to be higher because yeah. you're younger, you're going to be leading this industry when I call it a day and say, okay, I'm done with security. And so, no, I, I definitely love that. And it really resonates with, with me. You had mentioned that you went to school, you developed a network and that's how you kind of helped out. Um, any mentors that helped you along the way? Because I know a lot of people, and this is not only in cybersecurity, but any profession that, that you're trying to get into, yeah. how has mentorship um, helped you out in your career? So there's a lot of mentors that I've looked up to, whether they know me or not, um, right? Because you can still follow people, even if you don't know them personally. I um, actually have a, per, um, a friend of mine who moved from Jersey. We worked in local government together for a while before I quit. And she is quite a bit older than me, but that doesn't mean anything, right? Because younger people can also be your mentor because some really young people I've met are really smart and it's really scary yeah. because it made me wonder, what was I thinking at that age? <laughs> I was not thinking what you're thinking. And anyway, so she's one of my mentors because she is, she has gone through a lot, both personally and professionally, and I have as well. And she has always been there supporting me. And she basically helped guide me and gave me light and gave me direction and gave me a sense of, hey, yeah, you, this might be really hard right now, but like they said, whether it's good or bad, this too shall pass. And so I keep that in mind a lot of times, whether things are going well or things are going bad. So having people, and I, I've been saying this a lot at our recess event is saying, hey, when you come to these events, don't just come and just have a good time. Come and actually find your tribe. Figure out if you can find a person that you can connect to or two, right? It may not happen at every event, but figure out if you can find two people that you can get together with on a regular basis that you somehow connect with. Because there's people that you can, that are acquaintances and then there's other people you can talk and be real with and share your struggles with and they won't use that against you in any kind of setting. So I always encourage people to say, find that because you never know, you never know who can be your mentor. You never know who can be your confidant. You never know who will be there for you if you're down one day. Right. And they won't kick you in the face when you share with them how low you are because something happened and it could be something happening at home. It could be something at work. So I always find that's really valuable, whether it's formal or not. I used to be a formal, you know, in high school or college, former formal mentor for like kids that are younger than me and i find that when you force it like that it's a little bit less organic so i like it where i just meet people and i follow up with them and they follow up with me and we meet up sporadically because we want to instead of having this kind of forced thing where you do it but i get it right if you're new and you don't really have that a lot of opportunity or time to really uh, foster those relationships. You want that formal program to um, have a mentor program with you, um, mm -hmm. so you can take advantage of that. But I think I definitely having a tribe, having uh, mentors and mentees, really will help you learn as you grow and you help other people to grow as well because. Sometimes I'm like, I don't have anything to share. I don't have anything interesting to say. Like, why are you asking me? Like, this is just how I think. And, and I have people tell me that's really helpful. Or this one piece of information that I said that I, to me was very obvious, but to her, it wasn't. So I would never negate at any age or any gender, whatever you identify with. I think anyone has something to share, but if you find someone that you really connect with on just a level where, hey, I really like this person. I think I can develop that relationship with him. What's in the news saying now? Basically make a deposit in that relationship. Mm -hmm. So when you do need to withdraw, it could be years later, um, you then are able to, you foster that relationship as much as you can versus only call them or reach out to them if you need something. So, because then that kind of becomes a transactional relationship that, you, that no one's going to sustain. I find that it's a fine line. So if you do meet somebody at an event, how often, because I've received this question, how often should you try to engage? Because everybody's busy. And I know, especially nowadays with the holidays, yeah. they're trying to break away the best they can from, from work mm -hmm. and spend time with, with their families or just mental health days just to get away from the computer and technology. So how do you balance that 
you know, how many messages, if there is a magic number out there yes. or time frame, mm -hmm. uh, just curious. I would ask them when you can tell us so you spend an hour with them. Hey, I really would like to get some coffee with you or have lunch, or I don't want to wait till the next networking event to see you. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Because some people check emails really well. Some people check texts very well. Some people check LinkedIn messages. Some people don't do any. Right. <laughs> you have to call them. I don't know. I'm just making that. I don't think anybody wants to call, call anyone. Mm. Um, so you ask them basically, you say, Hey, are you okay if I reach out to you later? And most of the time, if you reach out them out to them once or twice and they meant it, they'll respond to me. I would ask what's the best form of communication that is, that's huge. And then I would follow up probably once or twice, maybe three times max, if they don't respond within three times. Yeah. I think they're too busy. You also have to make sure you come at it at the same level. Just because you want time from them doesn't mean that there's like this hierarchy where you are lower than they are. Oh, they have more experience, so I'm lower. I hate that perspective only because I think then it comes from a you need something from them perspective and they almost have a some kind of power over you. There's not there's no power dynamic from my perspective. I don't care if you're a really fancy executive or you're just an intern. To me, they're both humans and we should treat them all equally. So if you have an executive that you're trying to talk to, one, I will ask why. Are you just trying to find a job and you want them to basically give you a job? That, that's probably not the best way. Also, if you're a you're an intern and you're trying to get a conversation with the CEO, it might not be the best way to get to the information that you need. The reason why I say that is because there's so many layers between the CEO and the intern and the manager who's in, uh, managing the intern and your questions may be answered by the manager. You don't need to go to CEO. So also keep that in mind as well, but also always make sure that the people you reach out to are honestly worth your time and effort as well. I would not want you to waste your time because your time is just as valuable as someone else who who is running a company or while running a big company because they're an executive. Like you said, I would give them the benefit of the doubt they're probably busy and they might say, oh my gosh, I meant to get back to you. Hey, let's schedule something on the calendar now. Or something mm -hmm. to that effect. Be pushy, but not too pushy. That, that definitely resonated with me, especially the kind of level playing field between mentor and mentee. I've never seen it as hierarchical because I, I view it as a symbiotic relationship. Yes, absolutely. Because you teach each other things, right? It's not just a one-way thing. Yeah, no, so I definitely love that. Um, in in WESIS, in leading that organization here in Denver, what has been the main questions that you've received from members and just events throughout the years that, you know, what are some of the challenges that, that you're hearing from, at least locally here in Denver? I don't have a good answer to this question that I get mm -hmm. most often. I wish I did, but I don't because I see the problem from both sides. The problem I see most is how do I get into security with no experience, whether they're transitioning or students graduating from college. That's probably the biggest one. The employers who want to hire people need somebody with a little bit of experience or something to be able to train them with a little bit of time and then they can hit the ground running. So there's a lot of gap in that because we have a lot of people that want to get in, but they don't have experience. And then we have a lot of employers that wants to hire, but the problem is they don't have budget to hire a big team. So they want to hire a few people that have mm. enough experience basically to do um, what they need to do versus hire maybe just a little less season or new and then they can train each other and then they can make things work better in that regard so i don't have a good solution to it other than that's what i get a lot because it's true i'm 22 i just graduated i want to keep security i have experience in theory or at least knowledge but it's not applied knowledge so a lot of companies they're not a fortune 500 company a lot of times it's hard for them to break in what i do tell them if it's opportunity if they can is volunteer Meaning, hey, if you have, have time, go help volunteer at the local library. They're like IT department. Mm -hmm. Or go help and help elderly figure out how to check email, how to use Facebook, all those things, right? That's hands-on work. Help, help secure the library network. They don't have anybody. Mm -hmm. 
So that's mm -hmm. one practical experience. Another one is maybe get an internship. Some organizations do offer paid internships. Then if you do well within that period of time, so try to get an internship before you graduate. So when you're junior, look for an internship. So by the time you're done, you have another year as an intern. And then after that, hopefully they'll hire you. It's not guaranteed, but a lot of times that's usually what happens, especially if you're kicking butt when you're there. And another one is that I heard recently that may or may not work. Take a job that's a technical role if that's where you think you're lacking, but in a space that's not a security. So if you're running to an experienced IT person and they're hiring and they're willing to hire you with no experience, that might be a really good way for you to get your foot in. You might do that for six months or a year, then you can pivot sometimes even in the organization itself, right? For example, if you're at ABC company, uh, you got in as an IT department, but then they have a security department that you can maybe pivot from there. So always take the opportunity to do the best you can at wherever you're at. Even if you don't like it, even if you don't think it's the best place for you right now, because it's not where you want to be, but you'll get there, but you need to shine now. Yeah. Um, I, I really like the the internship and even volunteering, right? There is a uh, young professional that's trying to get in uh, to cybersecurity that I met from Chicago, and they took a sales job at a cell phone company where they're selling whatever the latest phones to, to people, mm -hmm. but they're educating the customers about, hey, this is how you want to protect yourself from email, from fraud, there's a lot of fraud that is unfortunately targeting the, the elderly right. to, to bring value is, is always key. You mentioned, I think, the potential major gap between there's a lot of people trying to get in, but they don't have the experience, but then the budgets. So budgets are very limited, especially for SMBs. Right that they need somebody who is the jack of all trades that has that experience that can, can pen test, they can do vulnerability management, they can do Intel, they can do the SOC and everything in between, right? And probably so be IT at the same time. Set up, <laughs> set up this network, set up this yeah, firewall, exactly. right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's very interesting. And I guess when you're saying that, maybe reach out to the, the bigger corporations where they, there is some flexibility because the way I tell people, if companies are not hiring entry-level positions at the bigger corporations, Fortune 500, right. then I think there's a trust issue, right? Because you're telling the young professionals trying to get in, or even uh, professionals that are trying to transition into cyber, they, they've been a, a lawyer, law enforcement, they've been a doctor, and now they want to get into to our industry, when they're not able to get in, you're almost telling them we don't value or more importantly, we don't trust you. A lot of people tell me, what do, what do I need to do to get in? And it's, I'm sorry, I don't have a real definitive answer. And it varies you know, it depending on what industry as well, right? Yeah. The financial industry is pretty mature, at least when it comes to cybersecurity, mm -hmm. compared to the healthcare, compared to energy, oil and natural gas, or any other critical infrastructure. So yeah, yeah it, it's definitely a challenge. Aviation as well. Yeah, yeah, aviation. I covered aviation, not on the, more on the physical security when I was in, you know, in government. Yeah. It's definitely a, a major thing. I guess it wouldn't be a proper video podcast if I didn't ask you about AI. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on AI from any perspective, whether the network defender position or the adversary position, or how SMBs or even Fortune 500. What's your take uh, on on the current AI? Yeah, transformation? I have a couple of philosophy on it. Philosophies on it because I don't think it's going to end the world. So just <laughs> like the internet, right? I know Al Gore invented the internet, and so now here <laughs> we are. When I first got my computer, there was the internet, everything was really slow, and now you can't imagine life without it. Some people thought internet wasn't a thing. Some people thought cloud wasn't going to be a thing. So AI now, I think, is that next thing that we're going to have to figure out how to deal with. I understand the startup, the small company mentality saying, hey, well, we want to move fast and break things. That mentality, I don't love that from an AI perspective, only because even the people who are developing it don't understand it. From a data protection privacy perspective, I'm really cognizant of it. I want to make sure and enable the business to be efficient 
but I want to make sure that we have our own private instance to start with. Play around with it. Okay, we want to use it for documentation. We want to use it for internal tool, right? So a new person can type in a chat bot and say, hey, I need this documentation. If it's all in there, it's right there, it spits it out to them. Hey, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't require anybody to provide them a link, provide them a training and, and anything. So whatever useful information I think we can share that's not proprietary or confidential in that AI um, instance, but it's privately owned by your own company. I think right. that's a really good way to start. I understand there's certain... Uh, use cases that may maybe you want to use it as, and basically make it make it incorporate that into your business for whatever reason. But I'm a little cautious of it just because it's it's still so new and it's so unknown. I'm pro if we want to keep it private for now. And then when it comes to maybe interacting with the customer when they released Microsoft's chatbot and how dark and how quickly it got there, worries me from a company and brand perspective i wouldn't want an external chat that we have no control over just yet Mm -hmm. so i'm really optimistic about it i'm a really big proponent on um, biotech and so i follow a lot of different technology and different companies in that space and Mm -hmm. i can see ai being a different use case for iterative studies and iterative um, design when it comes to medical treatments and medical cures for different things that we typically take a long time, meaning decades to to advance, right? So in that space, I think it makes sense, but we have to use anonymized data. And that's also in itself is hard to come, by, come right by these days because mm-hmm. ref, you can infer so many data points. You're this tall, you weigh this, your age is this, your blood type is this. I don't need your name. I don't need your date of birth. I don't need your social to be able to figure out this is Danny who lives in Colorado, right? Mm-hmm. In that regard, not only from a regulation perspective, because from a, what I said earlier, I have a really strong sense of justice. To me, privacy and data is, is more of a fundamental right. So you and I should be able to choose how we share our data and what is being done with that data. I always preach that we should vote with our dollars, meaning if you don't like how a company treats your data, don't use them. That's is that simple. And at the end of the day, if they don't have data, they're not going to be able to make money. So there's a reason why they say data is the new oil, right? Because it really is. It's really scary on how manipulative they can be. And so I really caution people to be very careful about it, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't play with it. I use chat GPT 3.5, whatever we are now, whatever the non-paid version is, because I, they had a breed, so I don't really want to pay them. Doesn't mean you shouldn't utilize it. You shouldn't play with it. There's AI that seems comes out every day. They can build your, they can make photos for you. They can create things for you. They can create websites for you. They can do a lot of things for you. Education, healthcare. I think is going to have to find a way to keep up because it's going to be obsolete. The way we teach students, the way we deal with healthcare is going to be really different. And I'm really excited for that space to come. I, I, in the next two, three years, I think things are going to change a lot. And I'd be interested to know how schools are going to adapt because I, I uh, have a relationship with DU Law School. So I've been trying to put them a little plug in their ear that you guys need to ensure that technology, your lawyers that you're training, technology, cybersecurity, um, some kind of tech is something in your curriculum so they're not coming out completely blinded by all these tech issues that they may have to deal with doesn't matter what law firm they're at or even if they go into the public sector there's just so much of that they're going to have to deal with so it's really important for them to talk about that in some of their courses and make it available for their students to have the opportunity you take. I'm fully on board with the AI trained, but I, I think at the end of the day, just like you mentioned, there has to be that privacy and that ethical aspect, making sure the tool is not doing to increase biases of the people that are programming it, making it socially responsible is definitely the key. So I love that. Um, so to wrap things up, I want to ask you what book are you currently reading or have recently read that just resonated with you? And it doesn't have to be cyber. What book uh, is really top of mind for you? Right now I'm reading How They Tell Me the World is Going to End. So that is a security book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's this one. It's called The Game of Life and How to Play It Mm -hmm. by Florence Shin. I was in LA and I was browsing a bookstore and I'm not a religious person by any means. I don't go to church. Um, 
my mom is Buddhist, so she raised me that way, but she doesn't make me go to temple other than the typical Taiwanese traditions. And so that book resonated with me because it has a lot of really life philosophy and just the thoughts that I think you can use in a lot of different ways. It resonated me this one philosophy where it said, you don't, you basically put out what, it, this is not the law of attraction, but it's if you put out negative energy, you're going to get negative energy. But if you always think that it's going to work out, even if you're having a hard time, you're stressed out, but instead of just thinking what can go wrong, like this is going to go wrong, you focus on this is going to go wrong, that's going to go wrong. You, like, instead of focusing on those things and negative things, you focus on the higher um, energy in, in that, okay, this is really not pleasant, but this too shall pass. And it will work out somehow. I don't know how it's going to work out, but it's going to work out. So at the end of the day, I might stress out. I might have the difficult time and a hard time dealing with whatever issue I'm dealing with. But I feel like at the end of the day, if I'm able to say it will work out however it's supposed to work out, then it will always work out. And I find that my philosophy has always been that. And I didn't really know it until I read this book and I've been you know, stressed out for work, for personal things, like all kinds of stuff during the holidays, things are difficult, right? But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, things really aren't that bad. So you appreciate things a little bit better. It basically took me out of my stress and working and in the mode of stressing and worry about things that I can't have, I don't have control over. Whereas this book just gives you a uh, kind of some foundation and guidance that really made me feel like there's a purpose of why we're here. And I, like I said, it does mention God. It does mention some religious stuff and I'm not religious by any means, but yeah, it's a book that I think anyone can resonate with. Yeah, it's on my to read list. I still haven't purchased it. I'm actually in the middle of like 14 books and yeah. 30 on my shelf that I, I still know. need yeah. to get to. I just bought like a whole bunch of books recently too. So I'm going to be busy the next six to eight months for sure. So yeah. Awesome. No, I appreciate sharing the books that are really resonating with you. This has been Absolutely. awesome. Yeah, I'd love you. to, yeah, I'd love to have you back on the show, but thank you. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Danny. Take care.